So welcome to everybody and thank you for introducing yourselves in the chat. We're on the final minute countdown and we'll get started on time. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. We know we have some more people who will be joining us, but um, I want to just take a moment to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, to thank our sponsors for this amazing session that we are about to participate in. So this is the CASA UCLA CCEE Advancing Equity in an Era of Crisis webinar series. The California Association of African American Superintendents and Administrators, known as CASA, and the University of California Los Angeles Center for the Transformation of Schools put this project together to support equity and virtual learning as we all shelter in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This work has been made possible by the generous support of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, known as CCEE, we are grateful for their partnership on behalf of California's K-12 public school students. My name is Monica. I'm here today to, uh, to basically serve as support for you. I'll be working the back channel in the chat. So I'm, I've been in education for 23 years. So I love doing these sessions because I also learn so much. I always am a learner first. And so we really want to know what you've learned and what you got out of the session. So at the end of today's session, we're going to ask you to complete a survey to evaluate our time together. I'll drop that survey link in the chat as soon as we get started. And I'll also chat it to you a couple more times during the session. Also, if you are watching a recording of this webinar, please complete the survey as well. You can find the link to that on the extended session site. Um, if you use the chat to ask questions, as we hope you do, um, please know that if your question is not answered at the end of the session, that there is a way for you to use the go to the extended session site, find this session, and you can also post a question there. So we'll take a minute to answer questions at the end, but know that it may not be answered, but we're going to definitely try. Dr. West Weston will do that for you. Um, also, if you do have a question, we would like everybody to see your question or a comment. So when you chat, please chat to pa all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it'll only go to me. So we want everybody to see what you have to say. All right. So with that, if you are here for the amazing session that Dr. Ken has prepared for you, every science, every science, is it every science? Why did I write every science? Science at home for K-12 students, the kitchen, living room, and garage as a laboratory. And I probably messed that up. But this is Dr. Ken Wesson, and he is about to impart some very important information for all of us today. Again, I'm Monica. I'll be getting in the background in just a second, but I'll engage with you in the chat. So thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ken Wesson. Thank you very much, Monica. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you okay. just fine. Thank you. And Let's try to share the screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. We cannot see it. Okay. Sometimes you have to hit that little button twice to the share screen. Make it come through. So that share screen, and then it should allow you to select the the actual screen you're share. There we go. There we go. Got it. Everyday science at home. I said every. <laughs> it's everyday science at home for parents and students. And this is using the home, the yard, and the garage as laboratories. What I'd like to do today is to just share with you some of the information that we've gleaned from learning about how children learn best and the kinds of things that we can continue to teach them at home. Every parent knows that kids get excited about science and when kids are taken to the park or anywhere, they love learning about science and particularly life science, but they have lots of questions and they're driven by curiosity. And it's our job to help continue to spark that curiosity in every child. It's important for us to remember that every parent is their child's first teacher and that by engaging in shared learning experiences, you actually support their personal, their social and academic development. And there's nothing more important for every kid than to have those kinds of experiences. Also, young learners remember more content 
when they have firsthand experiences rather than just reading about them or tapping on a keyboard. The human brain does its best learning by doing. And this is why we say doing at home is very important for all kids and for all parents to participate because we are learners too. Confucius said, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And we want our kids to understand science because there's no enterprise that's more important for the future than making certain that every kid understands science and engineering. Most of the jobs and most of the best jobs are gonna be grounded in science and engineering. So today what we'll do is we'll talk about science and engineering activities that will provide your child with the knowledge of physical science and the skills in engineering and also help them maintain some of the critically important skills that they need to maintain while they're away from school because of the COVID-19. And then we'll offer some shared learning experiences that build positive parent-child relationships and interactions. And there's nothing more important than having lots of positive interactions with your kids. That's one of the best ways to foster future positive interactions with them. And most important, remember that you and your child are all learners that it's not just children, but parents are learners as well, regardless of age. So we'll start with science at home and we'll talk about making observations, having conversations and writing in science. And many kids who are off school right now think that uh, this is not a good time to write. This is one of the best times to write. And you'll see why in just a moment. Zora Neale Hurston said, research is a formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. And this is Zora Neale Hurston. They actually had a U.S. stamp dedicated to her. We'll begin by looking at bridges. And kids love making bridges and playing with bridges and ramps. And we ask first, what is the purpose of a bridge? How is a bridge constructed? Many of you, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and many of you have probably seen the Golden Gate Bridge, and you've probably seen some very elaborate bridges as you travel around the country. But we ask kids, well, what are the purpose of bridges? We have walkways, highways, roads, railways, pipelines, but they all connect lands and sometimes they're used to just cross rivers and canyons as you see in the picture. There are many different types of bridges. There are arches, trusses, cantilevers, cable stayed, and suspension bridges. We're gonna focus on cantilever bridges for our activities at home. Cantilever bridges are bridges that have a protrusion and an abutment that serves as a foundation for support. We can have a cantilever that goes in two directions, but it, the physics is exactly the same. At home, we can build cantilever bridges and do so in a very fun manner with something as simple as wooden rulers. By taking a wooden ruler and then adding a second ruler, extending one inch further over the edge of the table and adding a third, fourth, and fifth ruler extending over the table, you see we're actually building a cantilever, exactly like the cantilever bridge. We look at adding more rulers, but as we do, they begin to lean into the river or the valley in between. And so we say there needs to be a counterbalance. And so we add washers. And we pose the question, how many washers do we need to extend the rulers as far as we possibly can? And how far can you extend rulers, just as you saw over the edge of the table, without having this consequence, that is a bridge collapsing? We can extend those rulers, but you notice here that the rulers are beginning to buckle. You see a small space in between those rulers. This is the time when we add the washers to maintain the balance. And we continue to do so with additional washers until we can extend the cantilever bridge as far as possible. This is what STEM looks like when kids actually are engaged in building the cantilever bridges. This is what adults look like, and it's just as much fun for adults as it is for kids. There's no limit to how far and how creative you can be with building these bridges. I also do workshops with family nights and several in Nevada. And you see that 
students and teachers got very, and parents got very creative about creating all kinds of different types of cantilever bridges extending over an open space. And there's no limit to their creative thinking other than the simple laws of physics. Here's another bridge created. Here's one that got a little complicated, but it's still operated based on the same laws of physics and the bridge continued to extend. But kids get a lot of excitement out of just seeing how many different types of bridges they can construct and how many different ways can they observe the laws of physics and produce a cantilever bridge. And we say, well, what makes a concept or, ex or an experience memorable? And it's that it was personally discovered, not something you listened to, not something you read, but something you did. And what we find is that on the internet, some videos on science are as much as 40% scientifically inaccurate, but what you do personally is always 100% accurate and you saw it and experienced it yourself. More importantly, we teach kids to work together and by learning how to work together at home and at school, that prepares them for working together with other adults when they become professionals. Let me ask, well, can you make a cantilever bridge with pennies? And by making two rows of three pennies on the edge of a table, adding two more pennies on top of them, add one more penny on top of that until you have a pyramid shape, you can extend over the edge of the table, and this is the edge of the table. You can place one more penny at the end and once again produce that pyramid shape and towards the end begin turning the pennies towards the center until you have a U shape. And as you continue to build, what you'll have is a cantilever bridge built with pennies supported merely by physics, no glue, no tape, merely physics. It's the weight of the pennies. And this is the front view of that cantilever, cantilever penny bridge. Kids always ask, well, where can I see this in the real world? This is a cantilever bridge over the Grand Canyon. This is about 4,000 feet above the bottom of the canyon. And these are people walking out on that extended cantilever bridge. You can also make a hovercraft with old CDs. If you take an old CD or a new CD and find a plastic bottle cap and drill a small hole in the top of the bottle cap and glue that bottle cap to the old CD and then take a balloon and an air pump if you're a little short on wind take a balloon and once you attach the balloon and fill it with air, this is what you'll get. And your kids will find this quite exciting. A nice little hovercraft built from CDs and balloons. And it'll hover over any, any smooth surface, whether it's a floor or a table. And you can even, even hit the balloon back and forth and play a game of air hockey with your CD and balloon. The kitchen is probably one of the best places to teach chemistry, but also it's a good place for teaching mathematics, teaching kids counting, measuring whole parts, fractions, chemistry, the chemical reactions, but even more importantly, teach kids how to follow directions teach them sequence and procedures, logic, and also cause and effect. But we can do this in the kitchen by simply letting kids join us as we cook. You can also take some of the ingredients that you find around the kitchen and have some fun. And for this activity, you simply need vinegar, baking soda, an empty bottle, and then a spoon and a balloon. If you pour some vinegar into the empty bottle, and take your balloon. And one of the best ways to get these baking soda into the balloon is simply to cut off the top of, the, of a water bottle and use that as a funnel. And then drop the about a, one teaspoon or tablespoon full of baking soda into the funnel and it falls into the balloon. 
And once it does, turn your balloon upside down. pouring the contents of the baking soda into the vinegar, and you'll see an interesting chemical reaction. And you see it produces a gas, and that gas is captured into the balloon. And this is one fast way to blow up a balloon if you're a little short on breath by simply using kitchen chemistry. But kids find this very exciting, and as you notice, I have a tray. Always do these experiments with a tray. They can get messy. I also do kitchen chemistry with some of the ingredients that you find around the kitchen. And one of them I like to use, obviously, is Wesson oil. And any type of oil, you can even use Crisco, but we always recommend Wesson. But any type of oil produces a kind of interesting invisibility. If you take a couple of Pyrex beakers and then a, three glass rods and three Pyrex stirring rods, what you can do is if you look very carefully, if you place a Pyrex rod into a Pyrex glass filled with Wesson oil, the Pyrex rod appears to disappear. And that's because the refraction rate of, rate of Pyrex is almost identical to the refraction rate for oil. And suddenly you see the top of the rod, but no bottom to the rod. And that's because of the refraction rate. And here's a closer look at what that looks like with a disappearing rod. And here's a short video that shows you the same effect. You can also take the Wesson oil, water, and dye and teach kids about waves. And by placing a about one quarter water with dye, three quarters oil, you can actually teach kids the movement of waves. And it's not just ocean waves, but almost every other types of waves that kids will learn about. And this is from the Next Generation Science Standards, where students are supposed to study the nature of waves. And it's not just water waves, but tidal waves, microwaves, gravitational waves, seismic waves. All waves operate in the same fashion because they operate by the same laws of physics. Another fun activity at home is making lava lamps. And for this, you'll need three vials, a cup of water, Alka-Seltzer, food coloring, a flashlight, and Wesson oil, and likely a tray. And with those items, we add the Wesson oil, and here's what we do. Place two-thirds Wesson oil into a vial, then fill the balance with water until your vial is full, and then add 12 to 15 drops of food coloring, and you'll see the food coloring will pass right through the oil until it reaches the water. And then add one half tablet of Alka-Seltzer into each vial, and you'll see a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction looks like this, and it's very exciting for kids. And once again, always put the cap back on because this can get messy if children knock this over. But it's a fun way to teach the physics of chemical reactions. And once your Alka-Seltzer seems to die, just put in another half tablet and you have your lava lamp again. And this is, once again, Wesson oil, water, and it's one third water, two thirds oil, and let the container settle if you can. Doesn't really matter. It's not vital. But the Alka-Seltzer is the active ingredient. And as I said, it's not just exciting for kids. It's also exciting and intriguing for adults as well. <coughs> we can also teach absorption at home. And this simply requires five plastic cups and then four rolled up paper towels. And the procedure is simply pour the water and food coloring into three of the cups, leaving two cups in the middle, completely empty, and then place the rolled up paper towels. One here, one here, 
one here and one here, four paper towels. And then we sit back and watch to see what's going to happen. Let me point out to the students that you place a rolled up paper towel into each pair of adjacent cups. It's important to use this, this language if you can, only because it helps kids develop academic language, which is going to help them succeed in school. And we ask them to write down or describe their observations, and you'll see after about four to five minutes, the water will get absorbed, and you can tell it's being absorbed because the color of the white paper towel continues to change. And as you look at each of the cups, the empty cups, and the cups with colored dye. And you'll see that they continue to absorb. And we ask kids to write down their observations of those changes. We ask them what happened, and more important, the question in science is always why. This is when kids can go to the internet and read about the concepts. And what we find is that kids learn more by having the experiences first and the reading second, because what they do is they take their experience to the reading event. That's how they learn, that's how they understand, because it's the event itself that produces background knowledge that allows them to read and read successfully. Through these kinds of activities, you can teach prediction, clarifying, making inferences, summarizing, activating background knowledge, asking questions, developing mental imagery. These are important skills, not just in the context of science, but these are critically important skills in reading. And many of our kids have trouble, particularly in the lower grades, with sequence. And if you teach them sequence to science activities, they learn that there's an important order and that sequence determines the outcome. Water in our environment, very important. I'll let you take about 60 seconds and see if you can answer these questions. How many adults in the United States <coughs> can't understand their pay stub? And how many cannot determine the difference between two medical benefit plans? And how many don't know how to figure or compute interest on a loan or miles per gallon? And, but most importantly, how many adults can not determine the correct dosage to administer to a child based on a child's age and weight? And it's the last one that's most important. And here are the actual answers to those equations. Over 55% of adults can't determine the correct dosage of aspirin to get administered to a child. And this is why on the weekends, over 55% of the adults, those are 55% of the admissions to the ER during the winter, kids who have experienced overdoses because parents cannot read the dosage. You've seen charts that look like this that tell you approximately, <coughs> pardon me, how much aspirin a child should take at any given time. And this is based on age and weight. And what we want to do is to prevent poisoning. But we are poisoned on a regular basis through something called pollution that we see on a regular basis. Many of you probably recall the governor of Michigan and the mayor of Flint were on the news for almost every day during the Flint water crisis, where parents were protesting, poisoning their kids. Many of the water supply systems began to look like this one. People captured the water in bottles. It looked like this. Even the fire hydrants when opened, would spew water that was rusted and polluted. And this is what happened to the pipes. And we asked the question, if this is what happened to lead pipes underground, what was happening inside the bodies of young Flint children? We can actually investigate this whole notion of parts per thousand. And this is what the government always says. They'll say parts per thousand of two parts per thousand is safe in this environment, or five parts per thousand. But most people don't understand what five parts per thousand actually looks like or feels like. By taking these items, a 100 meter milliliter beaker, a 100 milliliter cylinder, and 100 milliliters of water, a tray, white aquarium gravel, and some small plastic cups, 
we've all seen what pollution looks like. We've seen models of pollution, and this is what you don't see. This is what you see in a stream, but on the right is what you don't see, and that's how pollution gets into the water table. I wrote an article for the National Science Teachers Association for their journal, Science and Children, which was received the Distinguished Achievement Award, and it was on models and maps. And it's the kinds of models that kids create in the mind's eye that helps them understand science better. And if kids can't create the pictures in the mind's eye, they're going to struggle with science, which is why these at-home activities are so critically important. In our cup, the back of the cup is going to represent a hillside. The front view where there is standing water will represent a lake. And we're going to insert 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 minute intervals where we'll look at different parts per thousand. And we'll take two drops, four, six, eight, 10, 12 drops of red dye that we're going to place into the cup. And this is what it's going to look like. Placing sand, tilting the cup until you can create a hillside with the lake. Now we can actually observe what happens inside. By placing 12 drops of red dye, you can see what pollution actually looks like in the hillside. Most of us, once a chemical is absorbed by the soil, we assume it's gone. It's not gone, it's just making its way towards your water table. This is what a hillside view looks like after five minutes of with two, four, and six drops of red dye. This is what the lakeside view looks like, which you can't see a thing. But the sad part is, oftentimes we're swimming in water that looks clear, but the water is actually being polluted. You just can't see the pollution taking place. This is eight drops, 10, and 12 drops. And interestingly, the lake still looks clear. We don't see the pollution actually taking place. And once again, the hillside view after 20 minutes and the lakeside view after 20 minutes with the varying dosages. After 30 minutes, lakeside view looks clear. Hillside view, you can tell the damage, but we're now beginning to see it also on the lakeside. After 45 minutes, once again, we capture similar data and we can make similar observations where you can now actually see the pollution even on the lakeside. And after 60 minutes, we see pollution both on the lakeside and on the hillside. For kids to begin understanding the effects of pollution is critically important. This is what happens after five minutes versus 60 minutes. Students need to understand that water quality is determined by these types of findings. And sometimes two drops will result in dead insects. Four drops of pollution will result in dead mice and small birds. Eight drops in, will result in dead animals. And 12 drops will actually result in deformities. And we saw this occur in a neighborhood right outside of Moscow where you notice every child was born with the exact same deformity because of the chemicals in the contaminated water caused by industrial pollution nearby. In Lake Michigan, one of the biggest problems, and it's occurring here in California, when people have consumed what they believe is an adequate amount of their pharmaceuticals, they flush the balance of their capsules into the toilet. And when they do, those chemicals actually reach our water system. Our sewage system treats for sewage. It doesn't treat for chemicals. And what happens is those same chemicals make their way into the water system. And in Michigan, they're finding frogs with six legs rather than four and the numerous other deformities. And we wonder what are the long-term impacts on human beings. There's an interesting book published a couple of years ago called High Noon, and it identified 20 global problems and 20 years to solve them. 
And one of those problems happened to, be, happened to be pollution. And we do need to solve the pollution problem. And there are many ways that we can. We find people dumping cartons just about everywhere around the world, but we can repurpose those milk cartons into bird cages. We can turn them into piggy banks. We can even open them up, cut off the top, and make them into sandwich containers. At the Houston Zoo, and Monica will appreciate this, at the Houston Zoo, they actually took old bottles and made structures. And they created art as a consequence by simply repurposing old water bottles. And for kids, it's important for them to discover and hopefully research and find out that after two to 10 days, banana peels and peels from apples and oranges will pretty much decompose. Packaged foods and paper, after about five months, they decompose. Orange peels, after, within six months, milk or well, cigarette and milk cartons that they disintegrate after about five years, but it takes eight, 80 to 100 years for aluminum cans to decompose. But 500 to 800 years for the plastics to decompose, and some of them never do. And what they do is they wind up in our oceans. And there's a place in the South Pacific where ocean currents have forced old bottles to accumulate. And that entire patch is slightly larger than the state of Texas. We can repurpose old furniture. And this was a, a boy had a dog that was arthritic and couldn't bend down. And so they actually built, took old furniture and built food and water containers for the dog so he didn't have to bend down and we didn't have to destroy an old product. Life science. For parents who take their kids fishing, and I would encourage you to do so, one of the most important things you can do when you take your kids fishing is to have them join you as you clean the fish. And when you clean the fish, identify the parts inside the fish. Students in high school biology will learn about the insides of fish, they'll learn about all of the in internal organs. But one of the best ways to teach them is firsthand, real world, real time, as you clean the fish. In Hawaii, we actually had kids draw the fish, we dissected the fish, and they identified all of the internal organs. And do you think they remembered? They remembered probably for a lifetime. Biology, teaching kids something as simple as growing plants. And kids love growing plants, particularly in plastic cups like these. And by placing the seeds near the sides, kids can watch a plant grow, begin to understand the stem system, the root system, the stalk, the stem. You can teach every part of basic biology by simply having this experience at home. You can also take a digital camera and capture slow motion videos of the plant actually growing. For those of you who are space challenged, if you live in an apartment, you can build what we call vertical gardens, and that's simply taking cans, Ziploc bags, or pouches, and creating gardens, just like you would if you had more space. Teaching life science, for kid, young kids love bugs and insects. They also love magnifying glass. If you can get a magnifying glass and let kids catch insects, they'll begin to discover that all insects have some shared characteristics. They have three body parts, six legs, two or four wings. They have eyes, antenna, tongues, but their bodies are designed in different ways, but the basic components are almost identical. And these are the kinds of things the child discovers when he has a magnifying glass. But even more fun is we tell kids, given these characteristics in all insects, can you create a new insect? Assume evolution has advanced and you've created a new insect. We let kids draw those insects and then write a story about the day in the life of the insect that they just created. 
And this is very important because the number one literary genre in the US is science fiction. But you can't write science fiction if you don't understand the science. And teaching the kids, teaching kids the science behind the fiction mm -hmm. helps them understand every science fiction movie that they encounter because they know the science. <clears throat> and we say giving kids opportunities to draw, to draw is critically important because we say you can sit and listen without thinking. You can even read without thinking or concentrating very much, but you can't solve problems without thinking. You can't write without thinking and you can't draw without thinking. And giving kids opportunities to write and draw is how you actually enhance thinking. And what we say is that drawing does for the brain during the day what dreaming does for the human brain at night. And what we find is that kids who lack the ability to create these kinds of visual images, they struggle with reading comprehension. And if you want your child to get better at reading, give them opportunities to draw what they have had chances to experience. We ask, well, when did human beings start getting involved in STEM and drawing and creating? And human beings have been involved in STEM before there ever was such a thing as STEM. Many of you probably recall the Henry Ford assembly lines for which he became quite famous. Henry Ford's plants were based on plants, living plants. They used to bring all of the materials to one spot and try to assemble cars. However, there's a gentleman by the name of George Washington Carver who shared with Henry Ford that there's a more effective way of building cars and that's to do very much like a plant. And that is to bring the parts into the stem as the plant continues to grow or as the car continues to be completed. While Henry Ford was given credit for the assembly line, the origin of the assembly line is more accurately attributed to George Washington Carver. Goodwill engineering. This is where we actually go to the garage and we can actually do a lot of fun things. And we can go around the house and pick up all kinds of artifacts and build fun things for kids. Here's the situation. We're gonna have, some, we're gonna create some STEM games for California executives who are stressed. And this is where we have a little machine that blows balls into the air, and then he has a, the executive has a chance to try to shoot those balls out of the sky. And here's the challenge. You're given eight different types of balls, and your job is to determine which ball will float in the air the best. Giving kids a chance to test them. And here's what I have. You take an old shoe box and just take some duct tape and an old hair dryer and place that hairdryer inside your shoebox. And now you can place each of those balls onto the shoebox just above the air, the portion where the air is being blown out. You can predict the order in which the balls will float based on their circumference, their size, the weight, the composition. In what order will they float and why? We can now teach kids about attributes, color, circumference, radius, solid, perforated, textured, dimpled. We can ask them which balls will float the, float the highest, second highest, third highest, and so forth. And this is what that process looks like. And this turns out to be the ideal ball and it's a little ping pong ball. But letting kids test the balls and let them find out firsthand, far better, far more effective for the learner than giving them the answer up front, which is, which is what we typically do. We can also teach them the principle, the, Bernoulli, the Bernoulli principle, which explains how and why that ball can float in the air without moving to the left, the right, up or down, it simply remains in the same position based on gravity and other forces. We can also teach kids how to build a slot machine and kids love this one. <coughs> By simply making ramps 
with all at the very top of the box. And this is just like the FedEx boxes that you received almost every day now that all of us are at home ordering from Amazon. And simply make a hole at the top, ramps where the ball continues to fall to as it descends. And at the very bottom, we have jars where you can win $1, 50 cents or 10 cents. And kids can basically drop the balls and hope that they win the dollar as opposed to the 10 cents. But we can teach kids how to design this so that no one ever wins a dollar by showing them how to design a slot machine that they've actually created themselves. And as you see here, you can make it so everyone wins 10 cents, but you can never win a dollar. You can make it so everyone wins. You can design your slot machine to produce the outcome that you want. And this is not cheating. This is exactly what happens in Las Vegas slot machines. Here's something I call, another thing I call Goodwill Engineering. And this is simply going to a garage sale, a thrift shop, to Goodwill or your own basement and find something like an old toaster and then remove two parts. And then with the child, put those two parts back. Then remove four parts and, and again, put those four parts back. Then remove six parts on the toaster and then diagram what you've taken apart, diagram the interior of the toaster, and then write assembly instructions on how to put that back together. And what you'll find is engaging kids in these types of, of activities, they'll begin to learn and appreciate the whole process of writing instructions, following directions, and making sure that other people can follow and understand the directions that you write. We say that our education system continues to teach kids in the same way that most of us were taught. But for the future, we want kids to be, get prepared for the information age and what's now called the innovation age. And that's the age of creative thinking and creativity. And that means we have to give our kids lots of opportunities to build, to create, to modify, to work, on developing what we call the adjacent possible. Horace Mann said education beyond all, all other devices of human origin is a great equalizer. It's the condition of men, it's the balance of the wheel, the balance is the wheel of our social machinery. I say it's not education, it's experience. And giving kids lots of experiences is how kids get better. And what we say that investigating science at home creates experiences that literally change their brain. And I liken it to jazz. We know where it starts, we know when it ends, and everything in the middle is what the audience came for. And it's what happens at the end helps us appreciate the connection to the, begin to the beginning. And these experiences have a lifelong impact because the learning experiences is what carries them forward for a lifetime. And the National Association of Independent Schools produced a booklet a couple of years ago, identifying the four people who made the biggest difference in crafting the future for private schools. And those people are Howard Gardner, Daniel Goldman, me, and Mel Levine. And I point this out because I got involved in science when I was a third grader. There was something called Time Life Books, and you could send in $1 and they would send you a book a month. And I got the science books every month for five months, but they also sent a microscope. And it was the microscope that make it, made the biggest difference in my life. Having a microscope, everything imaginable went under the microscope. I looked at linen, I looked at leaves, I looked at insects, you name it, if it could fit under the microscope, I got a chance to look at it. And this is what set the stage for me going into science for a career. John Dewey said, we don't learn from experience, we learn by reflecting on it. And once again, I'll ask the audience, what was the most valuable idea that you learned this afternoon? And what are some of the kinds of things that you'll do to use this information? 
and how might you apply it as you teach both at home and at school for the future? And Monica, perhaps you can share some of the comments. Yes, I'm waiting for some to drop in here. So far, there hasn't been a response to this. Uh, most of the response has been just gratitude for sharing all of this. But so far, um, nothing. Here we go. Um, let's see. MVI was the structure for the pollution sequence. Um, that's from Leticia. Experience is learning. Learning by doing is important, Sandra says. See. Now, the question was, what's the procedure for the pollution? Um, I think they were responding to the question around the two things they learned so far today. Um, Sandra is adding that it's important to remember that we are our children's first teachers. Uh, let's see. Tracy says, let's see, I will start with the experiments and then take them through the reading. I found that to be very, very inspiring. Lorena says, experiential knowledge is valuable. Yes, what we find is that 95% of what a child gets from, from reading comprehension depends on what experiences he has had in the past and the prior knowledge he's gained that he brings to the reading occasion background knowledge turns out to be more important than decoding skills. Um, let's see, a couple more things. Uh, let's see, it's moving quickly. Steven says, I have applied these techniques with my daughter and this year she was placed in the top 10% of her science fair and qualified for the Broadcom Masters National Competition. Woohoo! Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yes. Eddie says that experience is where the concept is personally discovered. Um, see, Faniza says, as a coordinator, I would love to share these hands-on activities with our science teachers, um, using writing as a part of the process and having students experience the concept first and the drawing piece that you mentioned. Um, comment yeah. about learning being fun first. Um, Heather is talking about, this is great, kitchen chemistry, chemistry. she'll be sharing some of these. Um, all of our good projects, Ben says, nothing better when a student's eyes open in wonder. Um, I will use the slot machine game with my kids, Leticia said. I will also adapt to take, ad adapt my take apart Tuesday activities to incrementally break down and put back together as suggested. And um, there are a lot of questions and I, I, I did answer in the chat, Dr. Weston, around people being able to access this. And I mentioned that it will be, this will, pres presentation will be available on the extended session website and they just wanted to verify that it's okay for them to share some of these experiments with um, their colleagues, their peers um, outside of this session. And oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, as you can see behind me, I do a lot of these experiments at home. Yeah. And most of the experiments that you saw were done right in my office. Awesome. Love, love, love it. There are lots. There's lots of gratitude in the chat for you. Um, and the fact that these can be done with everyday items is, is very, very popular and very people are very gracious um, about that. Um, Sandra says you have to give kids the opportunity to build, create and modify. Paula says that these are all great visuals. Um, <laughs> uh, Laurel says, Dr. Weston, I want to take a master class with you. You are the best. And that is all caps you should know. <laughs> Much too kind. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the great part is uh, everything you saw can be done at home. There's no specialized equipment. Uh, I don't, can you see this screen now? We can still see it. Yes. Uh, I, I also do experiments in the laboratory. I do also some at home. And here's one that I've done with my sons. And as you can see, my son Tyler is on the right. My son Adam is on the left. And those of you who've ever had an EKG, I can take electrode buttons and place them on Tyler's arm and place the exact same 
put electrodes in the exact same position on Adam's arm. And what I can do is now, with a little device, I can stimulate, Tyler can actually control not only his hand, he controls his brother's hand. And so we have one brain controlling both arms. That is too cool. <laughs> Uh, this is something I didn't I didn't share because it requires a, a, a little safety and a little more equipment. But uh, this is a technique that I'm also using to help patients who've experienced paralysis. Well, I can actually get them to move their hands in exactly the same manner that I do to help rewire their brains. So there's so much that we can do to help kids understand. And matter of fact, I, my two sons, uh, the son on the right, Tyler, is a uh, student at Cal Berkeley. And uh, the son on the left is uh, heading to Harvard. And so we, uh, we do a lot of science at home, and the science at home will pay off tremendously. Wow, amazing. <laughs> um, to yes. Brian's question, um, you wouldn't find it on there right now, but if you give it about 24 hours or so, Zoom has to send us the recording, and then the recording can go to the site. So for anyone else who was wondering, Brian was asking, well, he'd gone to the website and didn't see the material there. So just give it a little bit and it'll, it'll be there available for you. Yes, and, and to answer that question, yes, by all means, take the video to your school, try the activities out. You'll find them very interesting, very engaging. And oftentimes people say, I have a discipline problem with kids. I say, no, you have an engagement problem with kids. Mm -hmm. When kids are engaged, you have no discipline problems. And our job is to keep them engaged and most importantly, keep them engaged while they learn. And yeah. the activities that you saw today are very engaging and kids learn from them, but most important, they learn the science. And there's nothing that, has, that pays better dividends in today's world than a background and understanding in science. For sure. Thank you for that. And to your point too, Dr. Weston, about the reflection piece, um, there is a message that I want to read on behalf of CASA, and it has a lot to do with that. I know that I've attended sessions, and I think I don't have any questions, and I walk away, and I reflect a little bit more, and I do have questions. So this uh, message from CASA is about that, and it says, because we firmly believe that every question, concern, comment, and suggestion is valuable and deserves a response, now more than ever, we've created a way for you to communicate with us. The Ask the Experts portal will now allow webinar participants and CASA members to ask a question, which we will dispatch to one of our experts. We will download the questions from the portal at 5 p.m. each business day, and you will receive an answer by the end of 40, within 48 hours. We look forward to serving you as we work together in responding to the needs of our members friends, and community stakeholders during this shelter in place season. So if you walk away and you think of something else, you also have the Ask the Experts portal that will be on the site. And then of course, this material will be available. And I will, before we close, drop the survey link again. We would love to, we've gotten a lot of love. Uh, Dr. Wesson has gotten a lot of love from you in the chat. But if you would take, the, take a few minutes to take that survey, we would greatly appreciate that too. Thank you, everyone, and have fun with science. Thank you so much, Dr. Wesson. Before you all go, I'm going to drop this link one more time in the chat in case anybody needs it. It'll also be on the site. Here is the survey right there. There you go. And thank you all so much for engaging in the chat and for introducing yourselves and, and sharing some of what you've done with your own students and children. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe and be well. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you, Dr. Wesson. It was great to see you again. You too.